everyone, and welcome to this edition of HCAM Sports Talk Live. Tom Nappy here. On today's edition of HCAM Sports Talk Live, we will play for you the Lauren Anderson softball field rededication ceremony. It was a great ceremony that took place a couple of weeks ago. We'll play the ceremony in its entirety, and you'll get a nice glimpse of the new looks of Field 6, the Hopkinton High School softball field. And also, Hopkinton High School Athletic Director Rich Cormier joined us a couple weeks ago to talk about the spring season. We'll replay that conversation for you as well. A lot of important information that you should know about. So without further ado, let's take a look at the Lauren Anderson softball field rededication ceremony. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you on this beautiful day. My name is Kathy Kilda, and it's my privilege, my absolute privilege, to welcome all of you today for the rededication of the Lauren Anderson Field. I'd like to especially welcome Lauren's family. Ricky, Bob, Amy, Mike, Julie, Tony and Precious Colton. <laughs> this day has been two years in the making, and now that it's finally here, it is time to celebrate. It takes a village to complete a project like this, that's for sure. Our village included townspeople, community organizations, businesses, Lauren's family, friends, teammates, classmates, and the Hopkinton School District Administration and the High Hopkinton High School Athletics and Facilities staff. I thank you all so very, very much. It couldn't have been done without you. Our project goal was to upgrade Lauren's field to the standard of all other fields at Hopkinton High. I'd like to think that we did it. Before I, I begin with my short comments, and as you can see in the program, there's four speakers, and then we're going to be having an exhibition game with Lauren's teammates and some of her classmates and the varsity team of today. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Lots of fun. Uh, I want to alleviate anybody worrying because it rained all night, so the field is wet. And for everyone's safety, the school is allowing us for the game to just move up to a drier field. So everything's taken care of. Before I begin, I want to share a story with you it's about Lauren and her sparkle. Her light guided us throughout this two-year project. How do I know that? Well, I can tell you a brief story about that. The Women's Recreation League also shares Lauren's field, and they called two years ago now and asked if we could come and speak at their championship game, which was being held at Kerrigan Park that year. So I said, wow, this is a great opportunity to talk about the project. So I called Amy, and Lauren's sister, and she offered to come with me. So she and Mike and I went over to Kerrigan Park on that evening. I talked about fundraising, and Amy talked about what it was like to be Lauren's sister. It was amazing. She talked about Christmas morning in the Anderson household. She talked about the fact that she was the big sis and Lauren was the little sis, but it should have been the other way around. That she learned so much from her sister and loved her so much. I think she touched the players as they were listening to her because when they went on the field to get ready to play the game, we heard the sound in the background and we couldn't make out what they were saying. And so we turned around and got louder and louder and louder, and they were chanting, sparkle, 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 sparkle. It was awesome. Very, a very special moment in the project. 
I think maybe a sign. Um, after that was over, we left, and when I got home, I had a text from someone who was at the game. And it said, did you see that? And I texted her back and said, no, what? And she said, when you guys left, there was a rainbow that appeared over Kerrigan Park. Now, I've been in Hopkinton for 47 years. I haven't seen a rainbow at Kerrigan Park ever. So my message to all of you is, sometimes the sparkle comes in different forms. And I want to encourage you to keep your eyes open because it's there. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to just take a tour with you of all the upgrades. First of all, trees were cut, brush was cleared up, an enormous job to get all of that cleaned up. I actually think the field grew, just like, like Scrooge's heart, I think the field grew three sizes. We now have an outfield. The scoreboard has been totally refurbished, every single part of it. We have two, I'm proud to say, brand new dugouts with benches and bat racks. Um, the bleachers, windscreens uh, and fence toppers were also purchased. We have beautiful floral landscaping under Lauren's scoreboard and we have two large rocks embedded under that same scoreboard that will permanently display our two plaques. The first plaque is Lauren's story and the second one is a thank you to all those people that have gone above and beyond for the project. Both plaques have been shipped and we are eagerly awaiting their delivery. I do have the text on for both of those plaques uh, printed out that I'm going to be giving to the media and if anybody wants a copy I'm happy to give one to you as well. So bottom line, thanks to each of you for being such a vital part of our village and for your generosity, enthusiasm, and support. You did it. You helped us meet our goal and bring the sparkle back to Lawrence Field. Sorry. And for that, I applaud you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, Superintendent of the Hopkinton Public Schools. Good morning. Yep. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here on this beautiful Saturday spring morning. I'm Carol Cavanaugh, Superintendent of the Hopkinton Public Schools. In the summer of 2019, Kathy Kilduff called the central office and asked for a meeting with the superintendent and the director of finance. On the agreed date, Kathy arrived punctually. The business manager and I initially were somewhat unaware of the meeting's purpose. And so we chatted pleasantly for a little bit with Kathy. And then Kathy, ever prepared, slid a folder across the table. It contained Lauren's story, Lauren's beautiful smile, and Kathy's dream of remembering Lauren Sparkle and restoring Field 6 in Lauren's honor. In my mind, and I'm sure in the mind of the Director of Finance, was another item in that folder, a really big price tag. Surely, Kathy Kilduff's goal was what some might have understatedly called ambitious. And honestly, I thought to myself, and I was keeping the words in the bubble above my head, how is she ever going to raise that money? Kathy confidently described launching social media campaigns and using several media outlets, our friends at HCAM and the Hopkinton Independent, reaching out to family, friends, Lauren's former classmates, businesses, to spread the word about the Lauren Anderson rededication event and fundraiser. And still I thought, she's never gonna do it. Well, 
Look around you this morning. You see two new dugouts, a restored scoreboard, all new fencing, cleared brush, and a superintendent with egg on her face. <laughs> standing on the most beautiful softball field in the Tri-Valley League. So right now I should say to Kathy, congratulations, you did it. But I think that Kathy would agree, Lauren did it. Her memory lives on and that very sparkle has fueled this fundraiser. Lauren did it. She is described as a young woman of positivity, energy, and determination, three attributes that some 25 years later have resulted in this amazing renovation and rededication. I personally want to thank all of you who have, in Lauren Anderson's memory, contributed monetary donations, in-kind donations, sweat equity, time, personal resources, and most importantly, love to this project. The schools and the townspeople here in Lawrence community will certainly enjoy this field for longer than another quarter century. Lauren will live on here in Hopkinton, in a tight-knit community, and in a world where a young woman's sparkle has transcended the turn of the century, a global pandemic, and any and every obstacle to, make, to making today's dream come true. Thank you all. Thank you all for your kind comments. We all appreciate it so much. Next, I'd like to introduce Curry Leahy, Lauren's best friend, teammate, and classmate. Hi everyone. Sorry, took me a little while to get situated. Um, and now, of course, following um, Kathy and Dr. Kavanaugh, I'm all reclaimed, and so hopefully I don't cry. Um, that will be my main objective for today. Um, before I start into what I had prepared, um, I want to do a little interactive um, event here. So I want to hear you all shout out. So we all know of Lauren Sparkle. We all talk about Lauren Sparkle, and for very good reason. I want to hear you yell out to me, what is one thing that you remember about Lauren? For everyone here that knew her, and that's a lot of people. So on three, just yell what you remember about Lauren. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. And one of the things I heard from, I think, I think Julie and probably others too, was dimples. And so to kind of um, follow up Kathy's story about the rainbow, um, my father and I will tell you that when we were driving home from Lauren's funeral, we were coming over the hill of Main Street to West Main Street, and in the sky was an X and two dots of clouds. And, you know, at that moment and forever since, we were like, Lauren and her dimples were showing herself to us, you know, that day. So, like Kathy said, look for it. It's there all the time. So, now to my real speech. Um, Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. And hi, everyone. Um, thank you so, so much for coming today. It really is an honor to speak with you. My name is Curran Leahy Lonegro, um, and I am here to represent Lauren's friends, her teammates, and her classmates. I'd like to use my few minutes today to do a few things. First, I want to be sure to recognize our fearless leader, Kathy, Ka Kathy Kilda. Yeah. Kathy gives credit very, very freely, and she takes none for herself. But without Kathy, we would not be celebrating this success today. Thank you, Kathy, so very much for leading this team. Second, I want to surround Lauren's entire family with our collection of love and admiration. 
I hope that seeing this outpouring for Lauren proves that she will never be forgotten. To Lauren's mom, Ricky, I want to make sure that you know this. You made a difference. Your capacity, especially as you faced such great sadness, to make others feel cared and loved had an immeasurable impact on me and on countless others. I love you. Third, and lastly, I want to celebrate our undeniable success. Look around at what we did. I think we celebrate best by ensuring that Lauren Sparkle lives on in the student athletes, in the community, and in all of us. To so many of us here, Lauren was a friend. She was thoughtful, supportive, and welcoming. As you girls play on this field, remember Lauren's friendship. Be a thoughtful teammate. Support younger, newer players. Welcome your opponents. Ow. Lauren was small, but mighty. You can see her mom. <laughs> she was a little powerhouse. She was underestimated. As you look at this field, as you look at this field, think about the small but mighty group that organized this restoration effort. Think about the small but mighty community that made this project a success. And think about all the small but mighty athletes who will be empowered by this beautiful field. Lauren loved being active. So many of my favorite childhood memories involve some sort of sport with Lauren. She was a great skier, a high-flying cheerleader, a talented equestrian, and of course, a darn good softball player. The next time you engage in your sport, whatever that is for you, think about the divine privilege that it is to be active. Appreciate that movement is an honor. When your heart is racing, when you're short of breath, when your legs are tired, know that Lauren is cheering you on. She was strong beyond measure, and so are you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Curry, for your wonderful thoughts and remembrances of Lauren. And now I'd like, I have the privilege of introducing my friend, Ricky Anderson, Lauren's mom. Can you hear me? Yes. Take your mask off. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jack. <laughs> Wow, I'm so humbled by all of this. See my nieces here? Almost overwhelming. It is overwhelming. What an honor to be here today for the rededication of Lawrence Field. With our family, our friends, our current athletes, and our future athletes. Closer? Yeah. Okay. For their generous donations, of time, talent, and treasure, I would like to thank the 26.2 Foundation, American Climbers Tree Service, Hopkinton High School Boosters Club, Hopkinton Parks and Rec, Hopkinton Little League, and Western Nurseries. Kathy Kilduff led the two-year effort to restore this field in memory of Lauren. Kathy recruited and managed a team of volunteers who oversaw the fundraising and kept track of countless other details to make this happy. Marie Eldred developed and drove all communications and media, all done from South Carolina to Boone. Um, and he can't be here today because he's on a long weekend with his family. But Ryan Fowler negotiated each purchase, 
manage the schedule and work tire tirelessly with the Hopkinton High School facilities team to install the upgrade. I think it looks great. Unbelievable. <laughs> And I know I'm not saying thank you to everybody, but thank you to everybody. If I've forgotten anything, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lauren loved playing softball. She loved the camaraderie, the teamwork, learning to win and lose graciously, accepting disappointment, dedication to the field, dedication to the game, and goal setting. She would be so pleased to see this beautiful, newly renovated softball field. And although this is to honor Lauren, I hope all the female athletes here and in the future of Hopkinton High School will enjoy playing softball as much as she did. Thank you for coming today. It is wonderful to know that Lauren is still remembered after all these years. And this field upgrade proves that she will always remember, that we will always remember her sparkle. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers. We appreciate your wonderful thoughts and heartfelt sentiments. Lastly, before we start our exhibition game, I'd like to say a couple closing thoughts and I speak directly to the varsity and JV team. So what made this project successful? Well, our village rallied together to raise funds for this upgrade 25 years later. Does it make you wonder why? Lauren was kind cared about people she tried her best at everything she did simply put she made a difference that is her legacy and in turn people remembered her so to the JV University teams we are passing the baton to you today we are all thrilled that you have this beautiful updated sparkly field on which to play. One that you can be proud of. What this means is you have everything you need to be winners. Pay it forward. It's your turn. Be the difference maker. And oh yes, one last thing. Your Hopkinton community, your village, is saying to you, when the game gets tough, always remember to watch for the sparkle. Thank you all so much. I'd like to bring up Tara Kessler, who will be throwing the first pitch. I know we're going to be moving to the other field. Um, maybe we should wait for that till we get to the other field. But when we do, I'd like to ask all of you for your help. Um, when we get there, on the count of three, maybe we can all shout, play ball. <laughs> Thank you all so much for, for coming. This concludes this part of our program. We'll see you up at the upper field. Follow us. I just saw along some roses so everybody could take one home with them. Oh. Kathy, repeat that, Kathy. Okay. So don't can't stay at that. the tape one. Ricky has, do you want to repeat that? They can't hear you with your mask on. Keep her in your thoughts as you play your game. She'll be laughing at you. <laughs> but nobody gets hurt.
Football Journal. We'll have Jared Keene from the Metro West Daily News, and we'll also later on have Andy Barron from MyFM 101.3. And, of course, we have everyone's favorite, Bob Hamilton, with us. Oh, yeah. Well. Thanks, Tom. Everyone's favorite. That's me. <laughs> and here's Rich Corman. He joined us, so I don't have to speak very long. Hi, Rich. Hey, Bob. How are you? Good. Rich, how are you? How's everything going? It's good. It's busy, but good. So you made it through winter. You made it through fall two. Well, you made it through fall one as well earlier on. And now we got the spring coming up. How's everything going? How'd the planning go? Are we ready to rock next week? Uh, well, we started. We're, we're underway right now. Um, so our first day of tryouts was uh, was Monday. So we have over 500 student athletes uh, participating, um, which is awesome. If you think of you know, just a year ago, right where we were a year ago. So uh, it's just great to have so many kids participating. Um, you know, there's obviously some unusual additions to the spring season with, uh, for us, wrestling and cheer um, being um, competed um, this particular season. Uh, we're still waiting on the modifications with wrestling, uh, but we have started our practices. Um, and then once we get those modifications, we'll be able to put together a full schedule and figure out what a meet's going to look like and you know, so some of those details we're still waiting on, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, no, things are going great. You know, I, I, you know, from everything I've seen, the kids are certainly excited. And I think there's a, you know, sort of a special place for, that I think everybody has for the spring athletes um, in terms of what they lost last year. Um, it, when you really think about it, 50% of the students we have playing spring sports right now, we're in middle school. The last time we had a spring season. Um, you know, and your, your senior class was sophomores, you know, you, you don't really have returning players per se this year. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that you don't really think about, um, when you lose a season, um, there's, there's a real trickle down, um, impact, you know, in terms of tryouts, um, in terms of, you know, coaches haven't seen these, uh, these students in a long time, uh, at least right. not in this capacity. And so, I mean, think of how much any player grows from their ninth grade year to the 11th grade year, the 10th grade to the 12th. I mean, that's a huge, huge difference. And, uh, you know, so I think that's a challenge that our coaches are dealing with right now and trying to evaluate during the trial process. But, but again, I think we'd all prefer this over, over what we had last year. So. Absolutely. The spring season, pretty much a full slate of games and we'll have playoffs as well. You'll have the uh, sectionals, you'll have the States. So it'll be, a pretty normal season, obviously a little cramped uh, more than usual. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, despite the fact that uh, there's a lot of players we didn't see uh, last year, it is all going well with the tryout so far? Yeah, so far things have been great. Um, the coaches have been great. The, the student athletes have been great. Um, you know, we got some, you know, uh, inclement weather coming in, unfortunately. But but so far, the first few days have gone really, really well. Um you know, and Tom, you mentioned this will be our first time out of the four seasons that we're going to play a full slate of games. And, and I say full, right? We're still not playing 20 games because we don't have quite enough time to play 20, but we're doing the full TVL schedule for those of you that, so for those of you that may not know, it's, we play everyone in the large twice and all of the crossovers. Uh, we've mostly just been staying within the large um, besides, you know, maybe some crossover games just to fill in the schedule when you lose an opponent due to quarantines and things like that. Um, and then in the fall, obviously we just did pods totally based on geography. So this is really the first time we're kind of back to that sense of uh, a normal TVL schedule. Um, and we do have a couple non-leagues. Um, we're not opposed to playing non-leagues. It wasn't, it was more that we just didn't have any place to put them <laughs> right <laughs> in our schedule. Um, the MIAA only allows you to play three games a week unless you have to reschedule due to weather. Um, so we already had Monday, Wednesday, Friday, almost every week. Um, and so as a result, we really didn't have much room to, to add um, besides a couple things here and there. Oh yeah. Looking at that spring schedule this is going to be the busiest season yet. No <laughs> doubt. And we want to encourage people uh, watching on our YouTube page to uh, feel free to send in their questions uh, for the Hopkinson high school athletic director, Rich Cormier. We also have Kevin Stone, Jared Keene. They may jump in with a question as well. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, uh, Tom. Yeah, I have two real yeah. quick. Go ahead. Rich, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, Kevin. So real quick, um, in terms of uh, how fall two went, um, I know I've had a lot of coaches ask me 
particularly spring coaches. Um, do you know how injuries went in terms of the fall two season? You know, were they were they higher, or um, do you guys just not really know that, or um, not know the top of your head? And um, and secondly, in terms of wrestling, what is that going to look like this year? And um, are we actually having um, outdoor matches? So the, your first question is, is a great question, Kevin. And um, I'll be honest, um, I was concerned about the number of injuries yeah. we might have, particularly in football, uh, mm-hmm. given the, the long layoff. Um, I know the kids found ways to work out, uh, but certainly most people couldn't use a, like their school's yeah. weight room. So there wasn't those organized um, weightlifting sessions that you typically have. Um, so I was, I was really worried about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be honest, I mean, we certainly had some injuries, but I would say it was, you know, pretty much on par with what we normally have. I haven't really crunched the numbers to see how bad, um, but I, we, we did not have a rash of injuries um, like I kind of thought we might. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it was very much normal uh, in, in that sense. Um, and, and wrestling, I think, is the question we all kind of want to know, right? Uh, <laughs> we're waiting to see what the modifications say. Um, and... I'm really hoping that we don't have outside wrestling. Um, I, I know in some senses it, it sounds cool, yeah. but logistically um, yeah. it's really not cool. Um, and it would cause a lot of problems. Um, it would also ruin a lot of wrestling mats, um, you know, which cost about $12,000. So, you know, they're not really designed to be, to be put outdoors. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can, we can have our wrestling um wrestling matches indoors you know for us i know you guys are familiar with this we typically use the doyle gym at our middle school so we'll host our home matches in the high school so that we have more space and can accommodate uh spectators uh so that'll be a change that we make but um i'm really hoping that we're able to do it indoors um but we'll see um i believe we're going to find out um i believe this friday uh, the board of yeah. directors will be given their final ruling. Um, and so we should get them sometime Friday afternoon. That seems to be a thing this year, a little Friday afternoon uh, news dump. And, uh, and then we get the information. So, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, but, but my expectation is, is that we would be able to wrestle indoors. I, I think there'll be certain parameters put in place in terms of space and capacity, maybe asking us to keep the doors open for more ventilation, um, you know, things like that. I'm sure we'll have to space out the benches like we've done in, in every other uh, sport. Um, but I'm really hoping for the most part, you know, the matches can be, you know, you know, pretty similar to what they would normally be. Mm-hmm. Well, you can always go with the uh, WWE ring type of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, a question that I think a lot of people want to know, where, will there be uh, fan restrictions during the spring season? So for, for most places, I, I think the answer is no. Um, I, I think individual districts will make decisions based on trends in their own communities and, and the comfort level that their board of health has, the comfort level that their district administration has. Uh, but I think you saw a little bit of the loosening of that um, towards the end of fall too. Um, now, again, we only had one outdoor sport in fall too in football. So the other three sports – we just didn't have the space. It wasn't that we wouldn't allow away fans. We just, we had very limited space, um, you know, and for swimming, for instance, we had to abide by the pool rules on who could come uh, for those uh, virtual swim meets. So a lot of those components are now gone because we're playing games back on our own facilities. You know, we're not in ice hockey rinks or swimming pools or basketball courts and things like that. So um, I, I think, what I'm interested in personally, um, and I don't know the answer, um, is what this, you know, I think everyone has seen that Governor Baker, um, I, I think, plans to change the mask mandate uh, this Friday. And I don't, I, honestly, I don't know what that means for us. Um, and I'm very curious uh, to know, does that impact schools? Because honestly, and I think most people know, the schools have kind of had different rules all along. Some stricter and some looser. I mean, if you think about it, we wouldn't have been in school all year long if we abide, if we had to abide by the number of people allowed indoors, right? Like some of the companies have had to abide by those, those number restrictions on how many people could be inside. If, if we followed those rules, there would have been no in-person schooling. Right. <laughs> so, so in some ways, we, we've been looser and in some ways, certainly we've been stricter. So I, I, I don't know if there's going to be specific information in whatever Governor Baker unveils that is specific to us or if the EEA will then take that information and maybe update their guidance 
which is what we are, as I think you guys all know, what we have to follow. So I think this is going to be kind of a fluid situation, um, to be honest, as we move through the spring. It would be nice to know before we start our games next Wednesday. <laughs> um, you know, but I think for now, you know, we're, we're kind of just going to be asking people. I actually have not sent anything out to our community because I've been waiting sort of to give the most accurate information that I could. But I think in the meantime, um, we're just going to be asking people to, to, to just continue to do those same things. You know, be mindful of social distancing. You know, as of right now, I would say that masks are still going to be required on school grounds. Um, again, I don't know that for certain, but I, I think that's kind of what most school, they're going to err on the side of caution. Well, I'm sure uh, most of the athletes are hoping that the mask, uh, man, they won't be in effect for them because I can't imagine uh, what it's like run, sprinting in one of those things. Uh, well, I, I, I've said to many student athletes, I, I don't know how they're doing it. You know, I, I really don't. And, you know, most of them do it without any complaining. They just, they're so used to it now. They just, they just kind of do it. And it's very impressive. I don't think the kids get enough credit, honestly, for playing in mass um, because it is really, really challenging. And I don't know if there'll be any changes there, as you just mentioned, Tom, um, you know, with the outdoor, you know, with the outdoor sports, I think for, for cheer and wrestling, you know, I think those are indoor sports and, and certainly they're also considered high risk sports. So I would imagine mass will still be in play for those two sports. Right. Um, but outdoors, you know, I, I don't know. Why is the left fielder wearing a mask? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I don't know, but um, you know, we're just, like I said, we're just kind of doing what we're supposed to do to make sure that we can continue to play. Um, and I still think if you ask students, if, if their option was to play with a mask or not play at all, they'd still take the play with a mask. So as hard as it is and as impressive as it's been that that they've done it for this long and throughout the year, you know, I, I you know, I think we're almost there. Um, one thing that you have to consider with schools is uh, or two things I would say is, you know, for those people that are making these decisions is you see across the state and really across the country, the numbers of cases of COVID are, are in our age bracket, right, are, are in the high school kids. Um, so that that may factor into the decision. Uh, and then the other piece is many schools, uh, like ourselves, we, we came back full time on Monday. Um, and so I, I don't think people want to jeopardize the fact that we are back in school full time, you know, with all of our students uh, on a daily basis. Um, so I think those kind of um, factors, you know, are, are going to weigh on the decision whether or not they're going to ease up on the mask mandate on school grounds. Um, but we'll see. Honestly, I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens on Friday and, and what it means for us. Um, because, you know, we're getting used to changing on a dime. We've done it all year long, but certainly this would be big. Um, so it, it and, and probably an easier switch. I mean, if, if I went out on the field today and told the kids they didn't have to wear their mask anymore, I'm pretty sure I would go over <laughs> just fine. Sure. So, uh, you know, it, it's more just to see that, um, what I worry about honestly is that it, it could be harder to enforce. Right. Um, right. If in certain places you don't need to wear a mask, but then we're telling you you do need to wear a mask, it's it, it's going to become challenging. Um, mm -hmm. It's already been challenging, uh, to be honest. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. How you doing? Oh, sorry, Tom. Jared. Oh, Go no. ahead, Jared. How's it going, Rich? Um, how are you? Not too bad, man. Um, Kevin actually asked about wrestling. I was, I was actually going to ask about wrestling, but I guess I'll just ask. Um, how much sense around the campus is there amongst spring coaches and athletes and even yourself and others involved that this is going to be for the most part, um, a relatively normal spring season. You know, I know that's kind of weird to say, you know, with changing on the fly and, you know, uh, you don't really exactly know with masks right now, but, um, how much sense do you there is there that this is just going to be a relatively fairly normal spring season, um, you know, getting back to, you know, the normalcy that people are, you know, or were used to, I guess, pre COVID and everything and, and all that. Um, yeah. Again, just kind of what sense is there around the campus is just uh, of normalcy, um, you know, for these spring athletes, coaches, et cetera. Well, I think it's all relative now, right? Like what, what, what is normal anymore? And, right. you know, so in some ways this will be a more normal season than we've had thus far, but I think there's a few factors that are going to continue to make this anything but normal. Um, I think we're still going to see large number of students who are going to have to miss practices and games uh, due to being close contacts or testing positive. Okay. That's something that's not going away. Um, the numbers of, of cases right now are still quite high. 
Um, and, and I know people, you know, many people are vaccinated now and so forth. And, and certainly I think overall as a society, we're trending in a better direction. Um, but I think this is still a reality for our athletes and I think they know it. And I think more than any other group of athletes, they know the pain of losing out. Um, everyone this year has lost out in certain ways. There's no doubt about it. No season was normal this year. Um, they've all experienced a tremendous amount of loss, um, right. academically, socially, athletically, musically, in every capacity. Right. And, um, so I, I do think it's going to be more normal on the, on the surface, you know, in terms of our schedule, we have a state tournament, but I'll be honest, Jared, and to everybody, I still really fear that situation where we have a state tournament game and five seniors test positive that day. Like yeah. there's still these things that are different and that are the realities that we're living with. Right. And that's what I still really do worry about, to be honest with you, because that's devastating. And then that's just one more loss uh, on top of all these other losses that the kids have had. So um, it, it's something that, I, I'm very mindful of, and I'm just hoping that we can kind of get to that finish line and, and then hopefully turn a page this summer. Uh, and, and to your point, Jared, truly have some more normalcy um, come, come the fall, um, you know, where this is hopefully less of, a, of an issue with positives and quarantines and rule changes and, and, and all these different things. So um, I'm still kind of in the mindset that we, we still really need to err on the side of caution, be safe, try to make sure people are making the right decision, being healthy so that we can get through these seasons intact. I guess especially with, yeah, I guess, especially with the spring season, knowing that again, all spring athletes lost out last year. I mean, this is a season that's very important to a lot of athletes, coaches, et cetera, you know, again, knowing what they lost last year. So yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Hey, Rich, just to piggyback off of uh, Jared's question, you know, that, that threat is still there obviously, but um, now that we're talking, you know, like we're on the back end of this, have you had a chance at all to kind of look back on this past year? Because um, I know covering my last football game the other day, you know, you kind of look back and say, holy crap, I can't believe we're here, you know, at this point now. Have you given yourself a chance to do that? Honestly, no. Uh, there has not really <laughs> been a uh, – there's not been a lot of time to reflect yet. You know, I'm just kind of day by day hoping we get yeah. through the next day. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long year. Uh, it's been a grind, you know, I think for everybody. Um, but again, we just try to keep at the forefront that um, we do what we can, right? Control what you can control. There's so many things about this entire situation that, that none of us have any control over. So I've just tried to control what we can. I've tried to ask the, the student athletes and the coaches to control what they can um, so that we can get through this uh, and make it the best. And then men maybe have some, some time to look back um, you know, I do agree with Kevin though. There was, there was definitely a time this year. I did not think we were going to have a football season. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that we've had it, uh, you know, albeit a short one, you know, we got all five games in, you know, and, um, I, I you know, I think the credit really goes to, to the, to the students and, and everybody who has made the sacrifices to make this happen. Um, our coaches have been tremendous. Um, I, I think coaches have kind of been lost in the shuffle of all this. Um, yeah. Coaches have given up a lot. They've sacrificed a lot. Yeah. Um, they've changed on a dime. Um, they've, you know, everyone who just coached in the fall two season was coaching out of season, was coaching in a time that they don't typically coach in. Um, you know, that's tough on their families. It's tough on their spouses. It's tough on their kids. Um, they're risking their own health. Um, so I, I truly believe our coaches have just been amazing. Um, honestly, going back to last spring, um, when, when, when this shutdown first happened, I, I, I was new here. Um, I, I didn't really get to know our spring coaches <laughs> last year. Um, you so, were fresh off the triple E incident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have to say our spring coaches last year were, were unbelievable. Um, the way they pivoted and, and handled it and engaged their teams through zoom workouts and, um, you know, just all sorts of different ways of keeping them engaged as a team to give them a positive experience. And that has just continued with, with each season and with each challenge. You know, I think it's to the point where a coach sees me calling them. They're like, oh, this guy again. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's tough. You know, it is tough to be canceling games, um, you know, the day of games. You know, it's hard enough to cancel a game. And, and you know, and we're obviously going to face weather issues this spring too. Yeah right? Which is the normal part of the spring, but it, you really hate canceling a game even more now. So um, it, 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 there's just a lot of challenges that we still have to get through. And then, 
you know, at some point, hopefully we can look back and, and, and feel good about what we were able to accomplish this year. And, you know, not everyone's going to be happy. Obviously, there's a lot of rules that don't necessarily make sense. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the athletic directors, we, we don't really make the rules. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're just tasked with enforcing them and um, trying to make sure that we, we um, don't get shut down, <laughs> to be honest with you. And, uh, yeah. You know, so that, that's what we're trying to do to make sure the kids um, and the coaches still get a chance to compete. Have you, uh, Rich, have you been given time now to kind of really be able to kind of get to know some of your spring coaches or some of your spring athletes and kind of um, develop a bit more of a relationship with them now? Um, you know, and, and I guess on kind of a second question, um, is there any, you know, spring sport in particular that you're really excited about seeing or are you just kind of excited about, you know, getting out and kind of taking in some of the various different sports that are going to be going on or, or what? Uh, you know, I, I have to say, like, although I haven't really necessarily seen our spring coaches in action, per se, uh, besides the last few days, um, I, I've been I, I feel like I've gotten to know them in some ways more than so than anyone just with what we went through last spring. Uh, and then the build up to this season, um, lots of communication between the coaches and myself, um, just making sure that we have things in place. So, you know, I'm excited to now see that them um, with their teams you know, and, and out there on the fields and the courts and, and also our wrestling and cheer programs as well. So, um, you know, and, and in terms of the teams, I'm honestly excited to see all of them. Um, I, I've said this a few times, but we've had multiple like college athlete, um, you know, signings and, and we have lots of kids going on to play at the collegiate level. And some of them I've never seen play the sport that they're going to play in college because they're spring athletes, whether it be baseball or softball, lacrosse or whatever it might be. So I'm just excited to see a lot of these teams um, compete. Um, you know, cause I do know quite a few of the students through other sports. So now get, getting to see them in, in a different, um, activity will be kind of cool as well. So, um, honestly, just the process of getting to know everyone ha has, has just slowed down, right? Usually right. by the, the end of your second year, at least for me, I, I would feel like I have really strong relationships with a lot of people, but you know, with the mask wearing and with the limitations and with students in every other day and, you know, all the things that we've all dealt with, it's certainly been a challenge to develop relationships that you would normally be able to develop. Yeah. I, I was curious, uh, and I'm guessing the answer is no, but will there be any rule changes with the spring sports? You uh, oh, you mean like drastic rule changes? Yes, like in-game rule changes. No, there's not much. Um, there really isn't. There's, there's a couple little tweaks with lacrosse. Um, nothing that you'd probably notice um, at all, kind of similar to the hockey rules about scrums and, and kind of the face-offs and draws and, and things. Like that. So really, really sort of minor stuff. Um, you know, we don't know yet with wrestling. Um, cheer certainly still has some, some restrictions compared to what they're, they're normally able to do. Um, track and field is, is, you know, again, there's some, some of the stuff is carried over where we're going to use every other lane you know, some of, some of those things, but, uh, baseball and softball, um, which were two of the first sports really to start back up, um, you know, last summer are pretty much, you know, there's really no rules there. The there one rule go, change yeah. is not COVID related is, is the pitch count in baseball, uh, which was oh. going to be instituted last year. Uh, of course we didn't have the season. So that's a new rule change through the NFHS. That's not a COVID related, um, rule. And I think you're going to see that though be very important. Uh, with everyone playing three plus games a week, um, right. you, you know, you're going to see a lot of kids pitching uh, <laughs> to, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, so I think that's going to be impactful uh, even though it's not COVID related. What was it like 60, 70 pitches a week or something like that? Yeah. I'd have to go back and look cause it, there's a few different well, factors that go into it, but um, yeah. Right. So you won't be seeing people like pitch on back to back days anymore. Like you used to. And um, you know, things of that nature. And I, and I think a lot of coaches did a great job managing it anyway. Um, you know, maybe not all coaches, um, but I, I think most coaches are very cognizant of, of their players and, and making sure they don't mess up their arms for later in life. So, Rich, I wanted to ask you, I know we've spent most of the time talking about uh, everything changes on a day-to-day -day basis and you're tied up with canceling, not canceling, moving on. That's part of the AD's job, but have you had any time to look forward to next year? What might happen on uh, the beginning of school next year? So what we're doing, it's a great question. So what we're doing right now, honestly, is we're moving forward, making our schedule as if we're going to have a quote unquote normal year, 
Um, so, um, and, and next year, there's going to be significant changes, right? We're moving to the statewide tournament. We're moving to a new ranking system. Um, so we are very much um, looking ahead as well uh, to your question, Bob, as a league um, and as a school, I've, I mean, it's kind of funny. I, I've, we were in the middle of football season and I was also talking about setting up, Hey, this team's looking for a week four game next year. <laughs> so we are very much in the process of, of putting in place our schedule for next year, uh, trying to find non-league games for next year. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of plugging right along like we normally would. Uh, we're a little bit behind uh, by now, honestly, in a typical year, the fall schedule would be pretty done. You know, I mean, except for some of the lower levels, the middle school and freshmen, sometimes you have to see who's going to have those programs and it takes a little bit longer to get those schedules confirmed. But, you know, our, our varsity schedules would be done by now for the fall. Um, so we're still working on that. But I will tell you, our, our, our varsity JV schedules for next fall are probably about 90 percent done. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of moving forward. But again, we don't know. Are our, our students going to be expected to wear masks next year? I don't know. So those are the things that we just don't know yet. So for now, we're just trying to, you know, kind of get ready. Here's what our, you know, when the season starts and here's what sports we're offering. Here's our schedule, you know, all those types of things. Well, that's pretty impressive that uh, you have about 90% of the next fall schedule done considering all the scheduling uh, that you had to do this year. Although I don't have a wrestling schedule for right now done. Yes. <laughs> well, that, that'll be the last minute one, right? Uh, is there going to be a postseason wrestling or is it just going to be some meets? So I mean, I know you don't know much, but. So that's a good question. So that I do know because the, the MIA made this decision earlier in the year that if a sport was moved, um, they still had to abide by the rules of that season. Okay. So uh. where we didn't have state tournaments in the winter, um, we would not have a state tournament for wrestling. Um, I'm not sure that they'd even get to the point where they allow like quad meets and multiple meets and so on. I'm not sure. Um, but okay. I, there, so there will not be a state tournament for wrestling. Okay. Um, but for the, and we're still waiting. We I've heard recently um, that they may allow larger track meets. So right now to have like one of those state track meets, you have to allow level four competition. And right now track and field is considered a moderate risk sport under the EEA. And so it has not been approved for level four competition. So again, if that changes, I think you could then see track also have their sort of standard div divisional and state meets that they would have at the end of the spring season. Um, but as of now, that has not been approved. So right now we only have a tournament for sort of baseball, softball, um, cross. cross programs, um, tennis, and yes, and that's it. That's going to do it for this edition of HCAM Sports Talk Live. Don't forget, you can catch HCAM Sports Talk Live every Wednesday at 3 p.m. For everyone at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. Take care, and we'll talk to you again soon.